So Apple products are malware. Flash Player is malware too. It has a surveillance feature and digital handcuffs. Now Flash Player is gratis, but it's not free software. The users don't get the four freedoms. So does it make any difference that Flash Player is gratis? It means that Adobe doesn't make the users pay to be abused. <laughs> but I wouldn't have Flash Player on my computer if they paid me. <clears throat> so Flash Player is malware. In addition, the Amazon swindle is malware. <laughs> because it's designed to swindle readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers. For instance, there's the freedom to obtain a book anonymously, paying cash, the way I did this morning. <clears throat> you can't do that with a swindle because most books that are regularly in print are only available for the swindle from Amazon. And Amazon makes users identify themselves. So Amazon has a giant database listing all the books each user has read. The existence of such a database, no matter where it might be, is a threat to human rights. It's a recipe for tyranny. And in a country with unjust laws such as this one, under the USAP at Riot Act, the FBI can collect all that database information en masse from Amazon every week and save it forever. So Big Brother also knows which books every user has read. There's also the freedom to give a book to someone else, perhaps after you read it, or lend a book to someone else when you feel like it. And there's all, even to sell the book, perhaps to a used bookstore like the one I visited this morning. Amazon eliminates those freedoms with digital handcuffs, making it impossible to do, unless you find a way to break the handcuffs. <clears throat> and in addition, Amazon displays contempt for private property. Amazon says that users can't own a book. They can only get a license to read it under Amazon's choice of conditions. <coughs> then there's the freedom to keep a book as long as you wish and eventually pass it on to your children. Amazon eliminates that freedom with a back door in the swindle. Now, we don't know all the things that this back door can do. We don't know if it's universal. We only know one thing about it from observation. In 2009, Amazon remotely deleted thousands of copies of a particular book. And people saw that this had happened. Those were copies that until that day were authorized copies that the users had obtained directly from Amazon. And as a result, Amazon knew exactly where they were. Amazon knew exactly where to send the commands to erase those books. And what was the name of the book with which Amazon demonstrated the Orwellian nature of this product? Some of you know, it was 1984 by George Orwell. Holy crap. In fiction, I wouldn't dare make up something like that. In, too implausible sounding. It would make the book sound like a satire instead of believable, but that's what they did. <clears throat> there was a lot of criticism, and Amazon said it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. <laughs> Not very comforting. <clears throat> <clears throat> you should all read 1984. It's about a tyrannical state that does things like destroy books it doesn't like. But don't read it on the swindle. <laughs> of course, that's not the official name of this product. The official name is Kindle. Kindle means to start a fire. Evidently, the product's purpose is to burn our books. <laughs> Too easy. 
Then there is the PlayStation 3. Sony announced that this product, although it had a layer of non-free software, whose purpose was to restrict the users, malicious software, that was the bottom layer. But it had the feature that you could install other operating systems of your choice on top of that, including free ones. <clears throat> and a lot of people did that. And then somebody found a way to get past some of the digital handcuffs by, from the free software. At which point, Sony told all the users, you are going to have to give up half the functionality of the product. You can choose to lose this half or this half. But you'll have to lose one or the other. In other words, Sony sabotaged its own product to maintain its power over the users. Specifically, users were told, if you install this firmware downgrade, you will no longer be able to run your own choice of operating system. But if you don't install this firmware downgrade, then you will lose access to Sony's network services for the product. So, uh, sabotage either destroys this half of you or this half. Just move your head and choose which wound you get. <clears throat> a year ago, people figured out a way to install their own firmware into that device. Sony sent the police after them, which is why we now call for a total boycott of Sony. Boycott everything Sony does. <clears throat> I could give you lots more examples. In fact, just a few days ago, I found out that lots of cell phones in the US come with a surveillance package called Courier IQ, which allows remote requests for all sorts of data about what's being done in that phone. So, I've just described the most widely used non-free programs in the world. And they're malware. But there are thousands more non-free programs without Freedom One. And we don't know whether they have malicious features. We can't study their code to find out. So in most cases, we're simply uncertain. Which shows that we must regard any program that lacks Freedom One as potential malware. After all, the same entity that might have put in a malicious feature is stopping us from checking whether there's a malicious feature. You've got to distrust that entity. But there is something I can be sure of. All these programs were written by human beings which means they make mistakes. The code of those programs have, has bugs. And the user of a program without Freedom One is just as helpless facing an accidental bug as facing a deliberate malicious feature. If you use a program without Freedom One, you're a prisoner of the software you use. We developers of free software are human too. We also make mistakes. The code of our free programs has bugs too because Every non-trivial program has bugs, there's no way to avoid it. But if you come across a bug in our free code, or anything in the code you don't like, you're free to change it, because we did not make you a prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. So freedom one is essential. But it's not enough, because that's the freedom to personally study and change the source code or do it within one organization. That's not enough because there are millions of users that don't know how to program and are unable to exercise this freedom. But even for programmers like me, it's not enough because we're busy doing certain jobs and we don't have time to change a bunch of other programs. In fact, there's so much free software in the world today that no user could possibly study and master the source code of all the programs she uses 